Okay, everyone, let's get started. Uh, thought I'd start out and uh, go over the quiz uh, real briefly. Uh, first question is, consider the following system Verilog module. What are the problems of this module? In this case, it's the, the assigned statement. Th there's an assigned statement and there's an always statement. And both of them are setting this output C. You can't have that. Okay, so each this assign is is uh, is is going to implement an inverter, and this always is implementing an AND gate. Uh, if B is uh, if uh, B is uh, zero, you guys with me? Um, but you can't. They're both going to be fighting each other as to what value C gets. Yes. So this comes back to. Yes, that and the fact that every statement is, is creating its own circuit. Okay. And you have two circuits trying to set the voltage of one wire. The other problem is that, notice that in this always comb, uh, it, there's an if statement saying if, there's an if statement saying if, if B, then drive C. But if B is false, it's, it doesn't specify what to do with C. So this will this always will actually give an error because uh, because C is not set on every control path, meaning every path through the if statement. There's there's uh, it's going to end up having to create memory for C. C is going to have to retain its old value if the always statement activates and doesn't set C. It's going to have to the only thing it can do is retain its old value, meaning that it has to add some sort of memory. It'll end up being a latch. This will end up, actually, this ends up becoming a latch, essentially, where B is the clock of the latch. So this becomes level-sensitive latch with respect to, to B. Everyone see that? So the two problems are you can't double drive C, and the always comb is not really combinational. It ends up being a latch. The way to fix that, by the way, would be to give, B a, a uh, sorry, give C a default value, like say set C to be something before the if statement. So that, that it'll set C no matter what the outcome of the if statement is. Or you could put an else on this if statement, which will accomplish the same thing. OK? OK. Uh, next question. How many input signals? Uh, there's clock, reset, load, and seed. So four. One, two, three, four. Sorry, one, two, three, and four. The challenging part about this is that because clock, reset, and load are all one input, they are all uh, declares input logic. You guys see that? So, so input logic, clock, comma, reset, comma, load, all three of those will take on the type of the, of the, last, of the last given type. Because the seed value is eight bits, we need to put it a new type designator in there, right? Okay. And next question is, what two operations can you perform uh, on sys should be in system Verilog code. Or no, on system, no, that's right, on system Verilog code. In other words, what can you do to system Verilog code? Uh, the answer here is simulation. You can simulate it. And you can synthesize it. Simulation is, is uh, simulating the behavior of the logic, and synthesis is converting the code into, into gates, into, into, uh, or into some target digital technology, whatever that may be. Usually gates. Okay. And the fourth one is what is the value of the state in the first three cycles? This is actually a system Verilog description of the problem from the last exam. Uh, the, the, except the difference is this doesn't have an A input because A is, uh, if you remember from the exam, A, there was an input A, but it was hardwired to, to 1. And for, in state bit 2 was not A, so that was always a 0. You guys with me? So uh, one thing that I I didn't get to the initial statement in the lecture. I'll cover that today. 
But I added a note to this question explaining what that is. Uh, the initial statement is going to initialize state to 1, 0, 0. So this is state 3, sorry, 2, 1, and 0. So it's going to start off as 1, 0, 0. And then in the next cycle, so we're going to wait for the next positive edge, in which case state 2 becomes 0. State 1 becomes whatever state 2 was. Now, be careful here, because these are non-blocking assignments. So when I say state 1 gets state 2, I'm not talking about what I just set state 2 to. I'm talking about what the old state 2 was. So this is a, you know, a good example of how non-blocking assignment works. I make this assignment. But none of these assignments in this always, state, always block will take effect until after it's evaluated. So when you say state 1 gets state 2, I'm talking about the old state 2, meaning the one from the previous cycle, which was 1. Right? So if this is, uh, say, cycle 0, 1, right, then um, um, State 1 gets state 2 from the previous cycle, the previous state, which is 1. And state 0 gets state 1 or state 0, which would be an OR gate between these two guys, which would be a 0. Right? And notice I circled state 1 and state 0 from the previous cycle, right? the row above it. And then in the next cycle, uh, state 2 is just going to stay at 0 because it's going to keep getting 0. Um, state 1 is kind of the delayed form of state 2. Uh, so state 1 will now be 0 as well, basically, because whatever state 2 was in the previous cycle is what state 1 is going to be in the current cycle. So you kind of have that sort of relationship. And state 1 is going to be 1 or 0, so 1. Okay. Why is state 2 1 at 0? Yeah. Oh, because of the initial, because of this line. Oh. This initializes it. Yeah, the problem with the initial block is uh, it, it initializes a signal. It's, it's, it's more useful in the, when you use FPGAs, programmable logic devices that can be reprogrammed. Because in an ASIC, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because that initial is the initial state it gets when it's powered on. But without having a reset input, see, I don't have a reset input on this. So I have no way to reset this back to its initial state during runtime. You guys with me? This is only when you power it up. But there's no, I don't have the reset in here that will allow me to reset it back to that first state whenever I want to as, it, as it's, you know, after it's been turned on and running. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, two of them. Okay. Uh, first question is, is the, is the third exam still scheduled for, uh, I believe it's next Wednesday? Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, it's coming up. Wow. Yeah. It, like, is it? Is yes. Yeah, yeah, it has to be. I don't have a lot of flexibility because of uh, Thanksgiving and that week that uh, that I'll be out at the conference. Oh, that's what, that's the next thing I was actually going to ask. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So that's the the quiz. So to to finish up this chapter, uh, I think I thought the best the the best way to do this would be to do another demo like I did last time. So uh, let's. I'm going to connect to a Linux machine in my lab. Uh, connect to Electron. And then I'm going to do my source user local third party CAD setup files, altera.bash. Now, by the way, this command, if you're interested in running and simulating Verilog code in, on any of the lab machines, you can, you can go into any of the, the departmental labs and log in into Linux and bring up a shell and uh, run this command to set it up. And then once you've got that, you can launch vSim, which is uh, model sim. This is a commercial simulation tool. I mentioned that there are some free simulators. 
Icarus Verilog and Verilator. Uh, unfortunately, I never told our IT guy to install those on, on the lab machine, so those aren't installed, but, but this one is. Yes? Uh, will you be posting instructions or anything on this? I could, sure. Yeah, yeah. that'd be awesome. Yep, yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's, um, I've, got, I've actually got some instructions from um, last semester. Okay, Post. thank you. Okay, so let's, look, let's try out another example here. Um, let's see, where am I? I'm going to go, I'm going to create a directory called, um, I don't know, test designs. Just, just so I have a clean directory here. And let's create a Verilog module that implements the traffic light controller from chapter three. Uh, it's a good ex I think that's a good example because we're pretty, pretty familiar with that. So let's call it uh, traffic light dot SV. Um, remember that the module name and the file name by convention match. They don't have to, but that's, that's a common way to do it. So if I call this file traffic light dot SV, then I have to call the module the same thing. So I'll say uh, module, whoops. Uh, module traffic underscore light and then uh, end module. So there's an empty module called traffic light. Now I have to decide on my inputs and outputs, which I will put on the module line here at the top. If we go back to the, um, let's see, where are we at here? Lecture three. Ah, here, this is, this is the controller we had. Remember we had four states and um, we had Academic Boulevard. Let me bring up a picture of the little cartoon they had. So there was Academic, oh, sorry, Academic Avenue and Bravado Boulevard. So we had a uh, Academic uh, and Bravado, it's, that's the intersection. We had an output called LA and LB. LA would be whether the Academic Avenue light is red, yellow, or green and LB is if the bravado light was red, yellow, or green. And we didn't want to switch a light, a light from, uh, from green until, we've, until we had it uh, as yellow for a cycle. Oh, and also we don't want to switch a light until there's no more traffic at the corresponding street. So academic, if academic is green, it will stay green until there's no more traffic at academic. So we have a traffic sensor called TA and TB. Traffic at academic, traffic at bravado, and then light is the output. Light at academic, light at bravado. So we have four states. Pretty simple diagram. So if I switch over here to my editor, um, one thing that's not shown usually in the state machine is your clock and reset, but those are things that you need for practical reasons. So input logic clock and reset. I'm going to abbreviate clock as CLK and reset as RST. I know I also have to have an input called traffic academic and traffic bravado. Notice I spelled those out because I can because it's a high level language. I don't have to worry about abbreviating TA and TB. Why not just spell them out? I'm also going to have an output that, I, two outputs actually, and because I need to be able to represent green, yellow, and red, the, the outputs will have to be two bits. So this will be light underscore academic and light underscore bravado, okay? And so both of these will be outputs that'll be two bits, and I forgot to put logic there because I have to remember that this is system Verilog, so we need to say logic. If this were regular Verilog, I would have not put anything there, but Output logic one colon zero. Everyone see that? This is pretty uh, pretty bad because this line ideally would not be longer than 80 characters, which I'm sure it is. Yep, look at that, 125 characters. So we'll put some line breaks in here. Um, you know the problem with that though is. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that looks much better. <laughs> there we go. Oh, let me put one more line break at the end. Okay, so remember, white space is ignored, so I can do that. 
Okay, so the, uh, I, I, it's a finite state machine, so I need three components, the clocked uh, logic, the next state logic, and the output logic. So for the clocked logic, oh, I also need my, um, my state type too, so let me add that first. So um, type def enum logic, the states, there's four states, so I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make this two bits, one down to zero. This will be S0, oh, sorry. Um, no, I don't, I wanna rename these. Um, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, green underscore, uh, let me see here, uh, traffic, da, 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 da. yeah, green underscore academic, uh, yellow underscore academic, green underscore bravado, and yellow underscore bravado, bravado, and this will be my state underscore type. And then I will declare two signals of state underscore type. I'll have current state and next state. Okay, so instead of using S0, S1, S2, S3 like the book did, I, I created more informative state names. So I'm gonna have a state where the, there's a green lighted academic, um, a yellow lighted academic, green lighted bravado, and yellow lighted bravado. Those are my four states. And I will have a current state and a next state. Uh, uh, local variable, local signals, internal signal. Then I need an always underscore flip flop at pause edge clock. Also, I want to have a asynchronous reset, so I have to also put in pause edge reset. And I'll put a begin and an end, even though I probably don't need it. And then I'll say if reset, then current state is green academic. That'll be my, my reset state. Else current state gets next state. And that's it. So if, uh, if I get a reset, I will go back to my, my reset state of green academic. Probably I should have a fifth state where, I mean, for safety purposes, I should have a reset state where both lights are red. But I'm just, I'm, I'm, I want to implement this exactly as the book did. Uh, so if you get a uh, reset, positive edge reset, I'll, I'll reset. Otherwise, if I get a positive edge o'clock, then I'll, I'll uh, take whatever my next state is and, and make it my current state. Then I need an always comb, begin, end. This will be my next state logic. And for this, I'm gonna use a case statement. So I will say case, uh, and I think you need parentheses here. It, case current state, and then end case. Um, the next state logic depends on the current state and the inputs. In this case, I'm only looking at the current state, but inside that case statement, I can put embedded if statements that consider the inputs. You guys with me? Okay, so if my current state is green academic, um, then I'll say if, oh, by the way, um, before I start that, um, I mentioned that you want to be careful with an always, always comp. You want to make sure you assign every output uh, under any uh, control condition. A case is a control statement, so just to be safe, I am going to assign a default statement right at the beginning here. Uh, next state equals green academic. So just in case I never assign next state to anything in this case, uh, it'll get its... Um, uh, it'll get its uh, default output. Also, notice up here, this was an always flip-flop. This was sequential logic, so I used a blocking assignment, this little arrow-looking thing. And down here, this is a combinational logic, uh, combinational always, always comp, and I used a blocking. So this is non-blocking, blocking. You guys with me? Because that's just the good rule of thumb to go by. Okay. Um, so if, uh, 
If I'm in the green academic, then if not traffic academic, then I'll set my next state to, sorry, blocking, next state to yellow academic. Um, let me see, let me try to make this a little prettier here. Um, hmm. See, yeah, just indent this a little bit. Okay, and then I'll say uh, else next state is green academic. So I want to if I if I'm in um, if I'm in if I'm in the green academic state and I have no traffic on academic, then I'm going to transition to the yellow academic state. Otherwise, I'm going to loop back and stay in the green academic state, which is a little redundant because I already set it, set the next state to be green academic there already. But um, notice that I don't have a begin and end because this if statement uh, only has one statement in both its if and else clauses. Uh, likewise, it, I don't have a begin and end for this case because the if statement counts as one, one statement for that case. You guys with me? So if I had more than one statement for this case, I would need a begin and end for that as well. OK. Um, let's say I'm in yellow academic. Then I know that my next state is unconditional. It's going to go straight to green bravado. And if I'm in green bravado, then I'm going to check to see if not traffic bravado, then uh, next state gets yellow bravado, else next state gets green bravado. We're going to stay in this state. Bravado. And then if I'm in yellow bravado, bravado, then uh, I'm just going to go directly to green academic. Okay, so Okay, so if I'm in green academic, and I don't have any more traffic on academic, I'm going to go to yellow academic. Otherwise, I'm going to go to, I'm going to stay in green academic. If I'm in yellow academic, I'm going to unconditionally transition to green bravado. If I'm in green bravado and I don't have any more traffic on bravado, then I'm going to go to yellow bravado. And otherwise, I'm going to stay in green bravado. And if I'm in yellow bravado, I'm going to unconditionally transition to green academic. Everyone agree with that? Looks good? OK. All right, uh, next, that's, and that's it. That's my next state logic. It's not really that clean. Let's see, let's see. Can I, I'm going to put some, some new line. Yeah, there we go. That looks a little better. OK. OK, and then now I need my output logic. So I'll say, um, I'll have another always, whoops, um, always underscore comb, begin, end, and Again, I want to put my default statements here. So my, what are my outputs called again? Light? Uh, light, yeah. Light academic, light bravado. So uh, I'll have light academic, and I'll assign that to, well, hmm. Yeah, I'm just, I'll just use hard-coded values. Eh. Actually, you know, just to be fun, let's try this. Let's put some parameters in here. I haven't covered these yet. So I'll, I'll create a parameter called uh, red, which will be the red encoded value. This way, whenever I instantiate the traffic light controller, whoever instantiate it, instantiates it can parameterize it and give it encodings for red, yellow, and green. So um, I'll say uh, red is uh, 0, 0. Uh, yellow is. 0, 1, and say green is 1, 0. OK. 
All right, cool. Then that way I can just down here I can say I'll say light academic is red by default, light bravado is red by default, and then I can say if this is a, a more machine, so this if statement will only be concerned with the current state. So if the current state is, um, should I use a case? I'll use a case. Case current, whoops, current state. I'll also, I want to remind you too that case statements and if statements can only be used inside an always block, right? And also notice that this always block, I have two always blocks. This always block is the master of the next state, is controlling the next state. If I were to try to drive next state in this always block, I'd have a short circuit, so I couldn't do that. Likewise, this always statement is the control, is the master or, the, or whatever, the driver of light academic and light bravado, so I only want to drive those in, in here, in, this, in, 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 the one, in the one always statement. Uh, by the way, if I had no always statements that drove a signal, it would show up in the simulator as uh, Z, I think, high impedance, Z, I believe, meaning that it's just floating. Although I think it might be an X, too, if it's considered to be a uh, sequential signal. Um, I don't remember, but it would come up as one of the special values. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, case, N case, and um, uh, let's see, if current state is green, academic, then, now here's, this part's going to be kind of neat because if my current state is, um, what is up with this cable, is connector, it's got to be the cable, come on, there you go. Um, if I'm in green academic, I just have to override the default for light academic. And academic is green. Um, if I am in yellow academic, then my light underscore academic is yellow. If I'm in green bravado, then my light bravado, bravado is uh, green, sorry. And if I'm in yellow bravado, then my light bravado is yellow. Okay. All right. Uh, and then I need an end for the always, and the other end is for the module. No. No, I have an end module for that. Uh, this end is for, whoops, I, have, I got too many there now. Um, Yeah, I had two too many ends. Um, yeah, case, end case, always, begin, end. All right, I think that's it. Does that look good? All right, so to check to see if this works, I am going to try to compile it with the vlog command. Um, nothing I have ever compiled has worked on the first try, ever. So I am guaranteed to get some syntax errors here. So let's just see how many I got. Undefined variable, green, bravdo. Well, there you go. Uh, but I don't feel so bad because none of you noticed that either. Um, I forgot what line that was on. There it is, Bra bravado. All right. And here's the next error. Oh, wow, it actually worked. Impressive. I didn't expect that. I only got one error. OK. Um, so now we can uh, test it out. But here's the problem. Um, how do we test it? Well, I, I showed you last time that if, you, if, I were to load, if I were to simulate that as in a model sim, I can use force commands in model sim to try to set the inputs. And then I can look at the waveform to see if it looks OK. But that's not a great way to do it. A better way to do it is to use a test bench. So let's create a test bench for this thing. Uh, so I will create a traffic light TB dot SV. Okay, this is a module traffic light TB. 
Now this module deliberately has no inputs and no outputs. It will be a self-contained. This module is not intended to ever be synthesized. This, this module, this test bench is only intended to be simulated. It will generate, it, it, it is going to act as a wrapper to, to the traffic light controller. It's going to instantiate the traffic light controller and then it is going to drive its inputs. And then I can either watch its outputs in the simulator waveform window or I can also put some code in the test bench that checks to see if the outputs are correct and have it be a self-checking test bench. You guys with me? But I can, I, this is something that I can't, I can't ever um, synthesize. This is only for simulation. When I'm convinced that everything's okay and everything's working, then the, the design that I'll be synthesizing is the traffic light controller, and this one I'm just going to be throwing away or saving it for you know, version 2 or whatever. Uh, when I make an improvement to my traffic light controller, I might be able to reuse it somehow. Okay, so there's no inputs and outputs, so it's just going to say module traffic light underscore TB with an end module. Okay, now here's where the initial block comes in to play. Um, well, actually, before I even have that, um, let's instantiate a instance of our traffic light. So traffic light controller, is it, oh, sorry, what did I call it again? I already forgot. Um, traffic light, it's just traffic light, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, here, let me make sure. Is that what I called it? Yeah, traffic light. Okay. So uh, I'll just say traffic light and my traffic light. Or, no, I, I'm going to be, actually, I'm going to call it DUT, design under test. Not that it matters because this is not really that important what I call it, but I have to give it a unique name, so I'm going to call it DUT. And um, I'm going to have to wire up its input. So I'm going to show you the alternative form of connecting um, actual, actual ports to, to, to formal ports. So I can say dot clock, um, dot reset. Those are my, th these are the actual ports. Uh, traffic, academic, um, traffic, Brav oops, sorry. Bravado and light underscore academic and light bravado. Okay, so these are my actual ports, and I left I left this the, the I left it blank inside the parentheses so I can hook up whatever actual signals inside my test bench I want to I want to hook up to those ports. You guys with me? Okay. I forgot something though. I forgot my parameters. Uh, now I don't have to specify those parameters if I don't want to, because I I provided these are default values of these parameters. I can override these if I want when I instantiate it, right? If I want to do that, I just need to do it right here. So I can say, I put this little hashtag thing, it looks strange, and I'll say, oh, I already forgot what they were. Um, traffic light.sv. Uh, red, oh, just red, yellow, green. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Uh, so, dot red, dot yellow, dot green. Put the parentheses after yellow. And let's say red will be, um, I'm, let's say I'm going to override it. Uh, let's see, it, I'll say red is going to be 1-1 one, one this time. Yellow will be 1-0, um, and green will be... Zero zero, whoops. One B zero zero. Okay, um, the formatting is. Sorry, yes, two bits. Thank you. Ah, yeah, I had moved the two. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, makes sense. Now the syntax is a little strange because I had to put the name of the module I wanted to put in. Then I put a hashtag and I assigned my parameters. Then I gave the name of the, the, name of the module that I want to call the instance name, and then my pins, my pin map, my port map. 
Okay, so before I do anything else with that, I'm going to start, I'm going to declare some local signals. Uh, I'm going to create clock and reset as logic. Um, let's see, uh, I need inputs. Uh, traffic, academic, traffic, bravado, and um, one colon zero, light, academic, uh, light, bravado. Now I, I name these the same as I did up here, which is I didn't need to. In fact, a lot. Uh, maybe I should. Uh, let me make this interesting. Let me rename. Hold on. I'm going to call this TA and TB. Just a TA is a reserve word. What? No. Okay. T underscore. Huh? Uh, TA. There we go. Um, TB. And I'll say LA and LB, just, just to, yeah, here we go. And what the heck, I'm also going to spell out clock and reset in this case. Okay. All right, so here's my, uh, my internal signals. And so if I want to hook those up to my design under test, I can do that right here. Clock is connected to the clock input. Reset's connected to the RST input. This will be uh, TA, TB, LA, LB. Everyone see that? So now I've got LB inside this design is the same as trap light underscore bravado inside my design under, under test. OK, now I can have an initial. And um, here's where I can start putting in some non-synthesizable code. So the first thing I need is a, I need a clock. So I'm going to set clock to be, should start out as one or zero. Say, say it's zero. So I'm going to set, I'm going to initially set clock to zero. Now this is where I sometimes run into some issues because normally, no, notice I used a, uh, an equal sign here, a blocking assignment. Not a good idea. Um, in an initial block, and uh, use a, a non-blocking. Um, this is not something that's in the textbook, but something that I've learned and, and students that have taken this class in the past have learned the hard way. It's better to use, in an initial block, use a blocking assignment. Okay, then I can add a delay of five simulation units. Oh, by the way, maybe I should specify what a simulation unit is. I can do that too. Uh, time, spec, spec, time, is it time spec? I always forget the, the oh, was, I got it. It is, it is time spec, but it's time spec. No? Ah, I forget what the, um, uh, uh, didn't I have it in here? The, um, Time scale, sorry. Time scale, not time spec. Sorry, it's got that. Time scale. All right, one nanosecond slash one picosecond. All right, so one nano. So when I say pound five, that'll mean one nanosecond. That way, I don't have to leave it up to whatever the simulator decides it ought to be. Okay, so now I can say um, I can set clock to zero. I can wait five units, which is one five nanoseconds because of my time scale. And then I can set clock to um, one and then wait another five. And actually, I screwed this up. This actually should not be an initial. This should be an always because once we set clock to zero, wait five, set it to one, wait five, I want this to repeat infinitely. So I'm going to actually just make this an always instead of an initial. I do need the initial, though, for my reset though, because I only want the initial only happens once when you start up. So that the initial the, the reset is only a one time deal. So I'll use a, an initial for the reset. So I'll set reset. Oh and by the way I need to spell that out because I'm in clock is spelled out in this scope. So reset is also spelled out in this scope. So I'm going to set reset to be um, one off the off the get go, and I will have it wait. This is an asynchronous reset. There's no 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 reason to wait a whole cycle here. Uh, 
where I could wait, I can wait as long as I want. Um, in fact, I'll just I'll do something random. I'll, I'll wait for 11 time units here, and then I'll set reset to be um, zero. Okay, so I got the reset set up. I got my clock set up. Uh, what am I missing now? I'm missing my other inputs. I so the job of this test bench is to you know take care of clock and reset but also to, to drive, to, to act as a stimulus for the other inputs, uh, all, the, all the inputs of my design under test, which are going to be just TA and TB. Uh, also, and then I, I want to be able to look at what the outputs are. So let's, uh, let's do another initial statement. Um, and I will set up some values here for TA. So I'll set TA to be... Uh, one and TA to be zero, and then I'll wait for some time, like uh, say 25, and then I'll say TA, whoops, forgot. Uh, I'll set TA to be, um, um, say zero, and then I'll wait uh, like 15, and then I'll set TB. Actually, I'll set TB at the 1 initially, and then I'll set TB to be 0. And um, and then I'll wait 50, and then I'm going to say finish. OK, so dollar $finish is a special Verilog function. Um, I think it's actually a VPI function, Verilog Programming Interface. Uh, but this will just finish the simulation, so it'll know when to stop. OK, so I don't have any, I'm not, now the problem with this is that I'm not, I'm driving, you know, I'm setting up reset. So I, I create a traffic light controller, I set up reset and clock and the traffic signals, but I don't, I don't actually check the output. So in this case, I'm going to have to rely on my my uh, Mark One eyeball and just validate it that way. So let's see if that works. Let's see how many. First of all, let's see if I can compile this thing. Um, traffic light underscore TB. Of course, I have errors. Um, let's see. I've got clock already declared, reset already declared, TA already declared. Uh, da, 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 13, 14, and 15. So what is the problem there? Um, so, uh, uh, hmm, <laughs> do I need to move these up maybe? That might be it. Yep, that was it. Um, extra semicolon units, go, let's see, line one and line 45. Uh, so I don't need a semicolon here. All right, there we go. So no semicolon after your time scale line. You don't need that, by the way. I just put it in, so just to show you that. OK, any questions so far? All right, now we're ready to simulate. So we go over here to model sim, and I need to change my working directory because I um, um, test designs. OK, so I'm in the test designs. And now that I've ch changed this test design, notice I've got this work library. And I've got these, these, uh, these, these modules in here that I've compiled. So I'm going to say simulate without optimization. And that should pop up the waveform, which it does over here. And uh, I need to, oh, OK, all right, gotcha. Um, I need to select all my, so. Now, notice here, I, haven't, I didn't show you this last time, but if you look over here, and, and you know, this is model sim, but even in the free simulators, they have a similar uh, user interface where you can see uh, the traffic light test bench is the top level design because that's what I simulated. But then underneath there, it's going to show you the design hierarchy. So you can see the dot is underneath there. If I click on the dot, it's going to reconfigure these objects to match whatever the signals are inside the dot. So that's basically the, you know, drilling down into a deeper level of the hierarchy. So when I click on dot, I've got current state, 
and I've got next state and I've got the stuff inside the controller, if I go to the test bench, I don't see that stuff. It um, doesn't exist. So I am going to, for now, I'm going to only put the top level signals that are in my test bench in the wave. Well, that's probably not a good idea because I want to see the wave, the current, the state it, it's into. Uh, well, I, let's, we'll try this initially and see what happens. All right, so there's my signal. So now all I got to do is run it. I don't have to worry about all this, you know, force commands that I showed you last time. I should just be able to run this, and it should just be, uh, it should, it should go, should go by itself. It should run by itself. Uh, do I not have a run command in here? I don't. I'm gonna have to do it. Hit this run command. Okay, now this is running for 100 picoseconds, so um, I had it set to nanoseconds. So I'm gonna have to do change this to nanoseconds, right? Maybe 10 nanoseconds. Ah, yeah, there we go. 10 nanoseconds is one cycle. So if I set this run, run length to 10, then every time I hit this run, it'll go for a cycle. All right, so some stuff's happening. Let's zoom out here. OK, so there's my waveform. You can see my clock is going. So that worked. Uh, my reset is pulsed. What did I say on that, like 11? I think 11 nanoseconds, so that, that's high for 11 nanoseconds. Uh, my, traffic, my traffic on academic and bravado are both high, but the traffic on academic dropped after 25 nanoseconds. Traffic on bravado dropped at 40 nanoseconds. Uh, and then my lights, uh-oh, so if you look at the lights, um, oh, what was the encoding again? I guess zero was No, zero was, I think zero was green when I changed it. Um, whoop, sorry. Um, uh, red, yeah, green is zero, red is one, right? So we have to use it. Because I, 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 did, I did this two different ways. I had default values for the lights inside the, the traffic light, but I redefined them when I instantiate it through these parameters. I just wanted to demonstrate how you use parameters. So this way, I can create another traffic light controller that has a different, a different encoding for the, for the light colors. So uh, red is 1, 1. Well, red is 3. Yellow is 2. Green is 0. So I've got a green light at academic, a red light at bravado, and then, oh, there's the yellow light at academic that goes for one cycle. And then it turns to red at the same time that the bravado light turns to green. And it's actually only green for one cycle because by the time that happens, I've got no traffic at bravado. So you can see that it's already going to yellow at bravado. So it only stayed green at bravado for one cycle. How's that look? Make sense? So I have to just look at this to figure this out. It looks like it's working. I don't really know for sure because I didn't run it for very long. But it looks good. And oh, by the way, what happens if I want to synthesize this? This is simulation. What about synthesis? Um, I could do that too. Um, I'm going to launch um, just to show you real quick. We're not going to, you're not going to have to do this, but this is a program that will do um, synthesis. This is for, FP, for an FPGA. It's called Cordis. Uh, we'll create a new project here just quickly and call it, uh, yeah, whatever, foo, next, add a file. I'm going to add traffic light, SV, because I can't, now I'm synthesizing, so I'm not adding the test bench here. I'm only going to add the, the core design, the synthesizable design. I'm going to add that, go next. I'm going to just select, a, you know, whatever, an FPGA, and then open that up. And then over here I can say, uh, let's see, uh, da -da -da -da, view, utility windows, tasks. Bring that up, and then I can go to anal analysis and synthesis. I can say, um, and, oh, let's see, I can say analysis and elaboration. So it'll run that. Oh, yeah, top level foo is undefined. I got to go over here and say traffic light controller is my top level. Set that as a top level entity. Go back to here, and that will, there we go. So that finishes. And then if you go to tools and you go over here to netlist viewers, RTL viewer, 
this is uh, kind of neat. So it shows the, the current state, which, uh, well, that's interesting. Just this has a, something called current state. But if I double click that, look what it did. <laughs> it actually reconstructed the state machine from the Verilog code. It's kind of cool, right? So this is, this is the same design that was in, in the book or in the lecture slide, except it's not in a square form. Uh, also, the next state table is here, too. It actually says if the source state is green bravado, then my destination state is going to stay in green bravado as long as we have traffic on bravado, for instance. right? So you got the next state table there. And you can also do this. Uh, you can say, instead of looking at it as a state machine, if I want to look at it as gates, as an actual uh, I have to go to this partition, what is this, partition merge. This is my mapping step. So then once I finish that, I can go to tools, RTL viewer, uh, no, sorry, netlist viewer. I can go to technology map viewer post mapping because I mapped it. And now I've got, this is actually the block diagram. So I've got, you can see, this is a, this is a flip-flop. You see that? D, Q, enable, clear and enable. And um, here's, here's part of my next state. This just says logic cell, but if I double click on it, it actually shows you what the logic is. It's a, an AND gate with two inverted inputs. I can actually, I can do that. These are input buffers, so these are nothing more than just amplifiers for the input signals. They're, they're buffers. Um, this is an output buffer over here. This is another logic cell. You can see there's some gates there that make up that function. Uh, there's another output buffer. Log there's a logic, log uh, output buffer, logic. So for some reason, you have to go and explicitly <coughs> open all these up. But yeah, there's the hardware design. So this thing converted it to gates for me. Yes? Um, how would you see the delay in You wouldn't see the delay. Uh, unless you, you would have to take it farther down the design flow. So I would have to place and route it. Because the delay of these, of these gates is going to depend on um, where they're, where they're, which gates on, on the FPGA I'm actually going to use. I'm going to allocate for these. But even more so, the wire delay is going to depend on how far apart this module is from this on the, on the, on the target chip. So even at this stage, I don't know the delays. Oh, the delay for the test bench. Yeah, no, that, I didn't, that's not a part of this. That would not synthesize. If I tried to synthesize that, I would get an error. You can't synthesize delays. Oh. So if there's, basically, if there's a hash mark anywhere in your system Verilog, that automatically disqualifies it from ever being synthesized. I can simulate it, which is what I was doing in model sim. But if I try to make it into hardware, there's no way to, there's no way to, to implement a behavior of a, of a five unit delay in hardware. Unless I, I mean, you could do it sort of indirectly because if, if you know the clock rate, you could put a counter, you can, you can implement a counter, and then you can wait till that counter reaches a certain point and then, you know, trigger something. But that has to be explicitly done in the design. You can't just say, you know, hashtag five and, or pound five and, 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 and have it implement that. I think the, the dollar finish, too, probably would have disqualified the test bench. Um, by the way, it never finished, speaking of which. I didn't run it long enough. Um, if I run this long enough, um, if I hit run a bunch of times, oh, 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 it just came up and I missed it. Um, I think it, it oh, I hit the wrong one. Uh, yeah, it says, you sure you want to finish? <laughs> the thing that stinks about this, if I say yes, it'll close this all down and I won't be able to look at the waveform anymore. So I'm just going to say no. But this is the point where 90, 90 nanoseconds is where it would have finished the simulation. Now, if this were a self-checking test bench, I wouldn't care that it finished. All I would care about is running it to completion because as long as there were no errors, I wouldn't necessarily need to look at the waveform. You guys with me? So how do I do that? How do I check the output? Um, mm, let's see. How would I do that? Um, I'm not going to have time to demo that today, so I'm going to go through the slides to show you that. Uh, let's go to lecture four here. Okay, so let's see where are we at. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about parameters. 
So this is the uh, this is an alternative form of adding a parameter to a module. In this case, instead of putting parameter width equals eight inside the module, you can also specify it on the module line. So this is this is equivalent to what I did, where I just put the parameter inside the module. You guys with me? So it's just another syntax. Um, I don't like this syntax. See if you agree with me on this. I don't like this because notice that. You say module, the, mo the name of the module, then the parameters, and then immediately after that you start your, your, your ports, your pins, right? But then when you instantiate it, you have to put the parameters, well, you put them after the name of the, the module, but then you put it before what you want to name it. So, so the module is mux2. So in this case, I have a parameter width, so I say mux2 pound 12, I want to set the width to 12. Notice also they didn't use the dot width, open parenthesis 12, close parenthesis like I did, they just just put 12 based on the ordering of the parameters, and so it just automatically will set width to 12. I don't like that syntax because it's not clear what you're setting there. Um, but they set the parameter and then they give it the name, low mux, so this is the name of the instance. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, in uh, the model sim window, that dot name actually does show up. So that's the one use of those instance names. Uh, OK, it crashed. But it, it'll show up when you drill down into your design hierarchy in your simulator. You'll see the, the, the instance names. I think that's the only place you'll ever see them, though. Um, so uh, anyway. Why am I confused? Because the parameter over here, it's parameters and then ports. But when you go to use it, you put the parameter, then you put this name in here, then you put the port mapping. So to me, I've always, I always forget whether the parameters come where the order is. So I, I don't know. I just don't like this syntax. But it's just an alternative way to do it. Everyone with me on that? OK. Um, Test benches, I mentioned that they're, they test another module. They, design a, they test a design under test. They're not synthesizable. You can make them simple, which is the one I just demonstrated for you. You can also make them self-checking, which I'll show you how to do that uh, on the slides. Um, or you can make them self-checking with test vectors. So here's an example. We have a module called Silly Function that just is very simple. It's even simpler than the the one that I did, this is just a combination of logic and implements, it's just one assigned statement. And they, uh, in this case, they designed a test bench by creating this test bench, again, with no inputs or outputs. All of the signals that are used as the inputs and the outputs of the design under test are declared locally here. They instantiate the design under test here. They connect the their, their local A, B, C, and Y to that. And then they have an initial. And in this case, they just assigned it different values. And, uh, and this is the same thing I did, actually. Um, assigned values for the inputs and then use the delay operator. <coughs> and then to change them. Right? So A000, zero, 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 wait 10, set C to 1. So after you set C to 1, A and B will stay at 0, 0. So it'll be 0, 0, 1, right? Um, I notice here too that they actually use um, they use blocking assignments here in the initial, right? Um, I guess in this case it doesn't matter because they're just doing combinational logic. Um, I ran into trouble when I did that on the when I was generating the waveform for the exam for exam two. I did this and it got me in trouble because I was setting the I was setting the input with these blocking assignment statements and it was causing the state machine to see uh, when, when, the, when the input and the clock change at the same time, these blocking assignment statements were making the state machine see the new input rather than the old output. You guys with me? Make sense? You might say, well, what diff why would it do that? It's because the blocking assignment statements can, can have effects even if you set the values in one block and you read them in another block. If those two blocks activate on the same event, then they act as blocking, right? Meaning that I was setting the input and then 
evaluating the next state function in two different blocks, but I was setting the input and the next state function was seeing the input immediately, right? Because I was using blocking. If, if, if that's not clear, it's, it's not, not that important. But um, so anyway, they just set the inputs here and then, um, then they have, this is the self-checking part that I didn't put into my test bench. Notice that after they set them, and after they give it a little bit of a delay after they set them, they can have an if statement that checks why. This is the output of the silly function. And if the output does not match what they expect it to match, then they display, they use this dollar display, which is a Verilog function, kind of like the dollar finished, and they, sh they, they display an error message. You guys with me? So in other words, if I give the silly function 0, 0, 0, according to the Boolean logic, the expected output should be a 1. I, don't, I can't confirm that without going back and looking at the actual function. 0, 0, 0. Right. So if I put 0, 0, 0 into this thing, 0, so this would be not 0, so this would be 1 and not 0, 1. So it would be 1 and 1. So that would be true. And or, well, doesn't matter because it's true or anything is true. So y should be a should be true there, which is why they expect it to be true. You guys with me? Um, notice that they, they screwed up here, I, I think. They didn't put the width specifier here on this one. It should be one apostrophe B1. Also notice that, look at this thing. Bang equals equals. Do they even list that as a, uh, is that even a valid uh, comparison operation? Wait, let's back up. Where's, is bang? No. Bang equals equals not even listed here in this table. Uh, it turns out it is valid, though. There's a bang equals, and there's a bang equals equals. Likewise, there's an equals equals, and an equals equals equals. There's two forms of the equals and not equals. Why? Remember in Verilog, there's, um, there's special values. There's z, there's x. Right? I mentioned it's not just one. Bits, bits are not just one and zero. They can be undefined or high impedance. Or don't cares, actually. You guys with me? Yeah. Um, sometimes if you do a comparison, you can do a comparison to see if a, if a high impedance equals a high impedance. But you can't actually synthesize that. That doesn't make it. Now, you might want to test to see if a high impedance equals a high impedance for a test bench, but if you were to synthesize that, that, the behavior of that would be undefined, right? If you actually try to make a comparator and you had two high impedance signals coming in, it wouldn't work, right, in actual. So the, the difference between equals equals and equals equals equals, I, now I might have these switched, but if I remember correctly, equals equals will evaluate to false if you compare anything that has an undefined or, or a high impedance in it. Whereas equals 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 will allow you to actually compare uh, the special values between, besides just 0 and 1. So you know, if you had two signals that were both high impedance and you had equals equals equals, it will evaluate the true. You guys with me? I don't know why they didn't include those in this table. OK, so back to the test bench. So they use the, um, they're using the, uh, oops, sorry, next one. They're using the. Uh, equals equals there. Bang or bang equals equals. Make sense? So this is a a self-checking test bench. So this one would you would just run it and you wouldn't necessarily have to look at the waveform. You would just look to see if it prints anything. If it doesn't print anything, then you can assume everything's okay. At least it passed all the tests that you put in the test bench. I didn't do this in my example because when you have synchronous logic, this is more complicated. This, this is an easy case because it's a combinational logic they're testing. So they, they, it's very structured. You set something, wait 10, check it. Set, put the next one in, wait for 10, check it. Put the next one in, wait for 10, check it. Right. Whereas in our case, we would have had to put in, we would have been very careful that our checks lined up with the timing of the state machine. So we would have had to make sure that, yeah, it might have not been that hard. But you know, we'd have to check that it's yellow for one cycle, for instance. So we'd have to make sure that these delays lined up with, say, a single clock cycle. 
Okay, um, and then finally, this is the last topic of the chapter, um, test vectors. So, as you might imagine, it's not really practical to, to do this kind of self-checking test bench for a complicated design. Um, if you have a more complicated design, you want to be able to load test vectors, which are um, test cases that are encoded into a file. So a test vector is a set of inputs and the expected corresponding output. So, uh, so in order to do that, you have to consider a couple things. One, you have to be able to read the test vectors out of a file and read them into an array. The other is, notice here that we've got this uh, pound 10, right? We have these delays where we had to automatically put these delays in. This does, is not practical if we don't know how many delays to put in. We can't just, we can't like go through the test vector file and put the inputs and expected outputs in and then have these pound tens because we don't know how long the file is. You guys with me? So another way to do it is to use the clock. You can assign inputs on the rising edge of the clock and then wait till the falling edge of the clock is when you look at the, the output and, and check the output of the device under test. You guys with me? Now, they're doing this, by the way, only because this is a combinational logic design they're testing. If this was sequential logic, I, I wouldn't necessarily be able to wait to just the next falling edge. So this is, this is kind of simplistic because they have a very sim simple uh, design under test. Um, Obviously, with a sequential design or any kind of more complex design, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to customize your test bench to match that design. You guys with me? Okay, but in, anyway, th th this, this type of design um, allows, them to, allows the, the book to, to demonstrate how to do file I.O. So this is a uh, the test vector file. This is, a, this is A, B, and C and expected Y. This is just in a text file. Remember, underscores are ignored in Verilog. And then... Um, they create an array called test vectors. That's a local, a local array, logic, 3 colon 0, test vectors, 10,000 colon 0. So this is another strange syntax thing of Verilog. For some reason, whenever you do a multi-dimensional array, uh, you put the width first. So each test vector is four bits wide, right? That's A, B, and C. Those are the three inputs plus the expected output Y. Four bits. The depth comes after the name of the array. So that's width and that's depth. 10,000 is just, they just put 10,000 so they knew they'd have enough no matter how many they, they just put this huge upper limit. You guys with me? What's confusing about this? Well, for one, they don't put all the, you know, they have the, this, this, these indices in one spot and these in another. But the other thing is, this is a little bit more subtle, but in every programming language I've ever used, when you have a multidimensional array, the depth comes first. And then the width comes in C and Java, for instance, if you have a multidimensional array, the number of rows, like think of it like if it's like a matrix, right? The number of rows is the first, the number of columns is second. This is reversing that. This is the number of columns in the 2D array, and this is the number of rows. So this is the width, and that's the depth. So that takes a little, you know, you have to remember that because it's different. Okay, so then they've got their clock set up the same way I did mine. And then in the initial block, they do a read MMB and they read example.tv. Those were the test vectors just in a text file. And then they put the test vectors array as a second argument. <clears throat> they initialize vector number and errors. Eh, again, they're not using the, the width specifier there. And they do the reset inside that same initial statement. And then, as you might imagine, um, let's skip ahead about every, 
Every positive, uh, sorry, where are we at? Was the positive clock? Uh, okay, every positive edge of the clock is when they change A, B, C, and Y expected. They bring those out of the test vectors indexed by vector num. And then in the, on the negative edge, on the falling edge, is when they increment the vector num, I guess on the next page. Yeah, they increment the vector num here. And they check to see if y, if y doesn't equal y expected, then they print the, the error. Make sense? So it's, this is a lot of code, but basically they have a counter. They use the counter to index the test vectors. Every rising edge of the clock, they grab a, a row out of the test vectors and they put it on a, B and expect, ABC and expected Y, or Y expected. And then on the, they have another always block and they say on the, on the falling edge of the clock, they check to see if Y doesn't equal Y expected. Now you might think, why do we need two edges of the clock for that? The only reason is, is that even though this is combinational logic, when you set the inputs, the outputs update immediately. But immediately doesn't mean zero. Immediately means some epsilon time. It, 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 you have to give it some time for the outputs to update, even though we're not modeling logic delay. Does that make sense? So for that reason, on the rising edge of the clock, they set the inputs on the falling edge. Now you might say, well, what about the, what's the clock period have to be? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the clock period is, because by having the outputs the inputs go in on the rising edge and you check the output on the falling edge, it just means that it's different times. There's a different time in which you drive the inputs versus check the outputs. Does that make sense? That's the only reason they're doing that. It, it, you know, it's, um, um, yeah, so that's, that, that is a self-checking test bench with test vectors. And that's the end of this uh, lecture. So we'll start chapter five uh, on um, Wednesday.